Good, welcome back, Lizzie. Um, in this episode, we're going to talk about um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO. Mm -hmm. Again, a word that's banded around. Um, what's the difference between SIBO and dysbiosis? SIBO, ultimately, we're targeting the small intestine, intestine typically. There's a, an abundance of bacteria that's had the chance or opportunity to grow out of control. Um, the side effect is that people get gassy, bloated, etc. In SIBO, typically, it's, there's a production, excess production of methane and hydrogen from bacteria, um, whilst uh, ultimately... Um, so SIBO is yeah, essentially more targeted to the uh, small intestine, whilst dysbiosis is just an overall um, term for imbalanced bacteria. Yeah, so SIBO is a subcategory of dysbiosis. Essentially, yeah. Okay, that's useful to know. And so this overgrowth means, is it an alien bacteria that's overgrowing or an existing bacteria that's just there more than the others? Good question. So ultimately it's there already um, and it's been given the chance because of imbalances or stress or you know internal issues to grow in abundance potentially opportunistic, if you want to call it that. Yeah. It can be second to antibiotic treatments, yes. or it can be second to stress or chemicals or yeah. um, external exposures. Yeah, interesting. Um, and it's given a chance to grow and it leads to a lot of unwanted side effects. Yes. And we measure it by looking at hydrogen and methane excretory products of mm. these bacteria that gives them an idea of which one it is. Yeah? Essentially, yeah. So a lot of people would have heard of the breath test. And honestly, basically what we're doing is assessing the breath for these hydrogen or methane products. Yes. Um, and if they're in abundance, it basically provides you with that diagnosis yeah. on the whole. And in your clinical practice, what's your approach to SIBO? SIBO can be tricky. It, it it's, can be difficult to eliminate fully. But again, it's about creating balance again. So FODMAP diets, we spoke about it in the last episode, they ultimately give the body a chance to reduce those um, kind of uh, carbohydrate foods that lead to this excretion of hydrogen and methane. So that's that's a really good starting so point. So reduce the food that feeds those bacteria. Exactly. Give it a break so it doesn't it gets rid of them. Yes. Um, and then we have sort of more stereotypical interventions where you use antibiotics. Plus or minus, it can be beneficial for some people, and for others, it might be more negative than it, than it is beneficial. Yes. And in those instances, we might prefer to use something for a longer period of time, but a natural antibiotic, um, and that could be neem, oregano oil, berberine. It depends a little bit. It depends on the patient and the results. People always ask me, how long will it take before I get better, doctor? I tend to give a three-month window. Um, what are your thoughts? I would agree. So you need time to give the gut rest yeah. through your food changes and dietary changes. You then need to give, I would say, at least six to eight weeks of um, treatment if you're choosing the sort of more natural uh, antibiotic. Um, and then you want to repair. So you remove the pathogens and then you restore. Um, and I agree that that takes yeah. about three to four months. Yeah, yeah that, that's good. Something I've always been curious about. We talk about these 23 trillion bacteria that live within our gut. Is there a global variation? So do South Americans have a different gut microbiome to the Western Hemisphere, the Southeastern Hemisphere? I mean, again, people are traveling all over the world. Is that good or bad? Whether it's good or bad, I can't answer. But what we do know is that in the Western hemispheres and in the Western diets, we have a decrease in variety of bacteria in the gut based on studies that we've done so far. Um, a simple example is the helminth bacteria. It basically doesn't exist in Western populations anymore. And what we know is that it's actually hugely beneficial in reducing allergies, allergic rhinitis, asthma. So there's a huge difference between Western and others. And is it good or bad? All we know is that we have a slight reduction in the West in what we have in our gut. Mm, interesting. And um, so I'm curious only because I know that um, from personal experience, people going to Southeast Asia, for example, um, having exactly the same food as someone who might have lived there for a while and then gone back, 
get ill and the others don't. Mm. And is this to do with the ability of the gut to react to these changes? Or? Sure, yeah. yeah. You're, you're not, your body wasn't ready for it. Yeah. Um, and all the microbes that work in unison uh, help to keep things in balance. And that's going to vary depending on the location you live in and the diet that you consume. Yes. Um, and hence we do get these kind of foodborne illnesses yes. that locals wouldn't not get. get. Yeah. Interesting. So SIBO is something that we can look for and we can treat naturally or use antibiotics. And, and I guess, like everything in the gut, we can't just look at SIBO in isolation. We need to look at leaky, leaky gut syndrome, rebuilding the, the wall again, mm. um, giving it a rest. So the principles seem to be applying across a lot of the things we've already spoken about. Yes, ultimately. Which is reassuring. Yeah, the general approach is really, really similar. There are nuances in the type of bacteria that you're treating. Yes. Um, but generally, once you've kind of dealt with them, the sort of end goals are the same yeah. and the process together. I'm particularly interested because we operate in the Levitas group, a very simple fundamental principle for every disorder, detox, repair, renew. Mm -hmm. I get rid of the issues through the detox. In this case, it would be FODMAP or elemental diets or autophagy, repair, let the gut wall fix itself, either using peptides or collagen, um, anti-inflammatory diets. Um, and then the renewal is that once the inflammation has gone, the body just gets back into balance again with the bacteria. Yeah. What are your th thoughts on pre, pro and post biotics? Um, vital, ultimately. Um, obviously, ideally, we get them through diets. But when we're dealing with someone who's been chronically, you know, under nutrients for a long period of time, we intervene by adding extra um, and prebiotics, they feed the bacteria, probiotics, they keep them multiplying. Um, postbiotics comes largely from short chain fatty acids um, and it's vital to serve one, the population inside the, inside the gut itself, but also the downstream effects that we know that it has on immune regulation, reducing inflammation, stomach acidity, breaking down foods, proteins, everything. Yeah, that's and your views on using things like um, for anti-inflammatory processes, because we have to deal with inflammation, turmeric, curcumin, slippery elm. Mm. Do you have any views on those? Or yeah, we, we, we they're beneficial. We know they're beneficial. They they work in all sorts of inflammatory diseases, um, and we use them uh, routinely to help reduce inflammation. Omega fish oil is another one that's yeah. really commonly used. Um, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Finally, fiber. Are we all having enough fiber and the right sort? Largely no, is the answer there. Um, we're definitely fiber deficient as a sort Why of, are we fiber deficient? It's to do with our food, how it's processed, over-processed food, um, the way we eat. So fiber obviously comes from the grains, obviously to a certain extent, but there's vegetables, there's fruits, there's all types of fiber ultimately. Um, and we just don't eat enough and the quality just isn't there anymore. Got it. So um, it's a, it's um, the, the source of fiber is weaker and we don't eat enough. Yeah, so ultimately. Yeah. And it's degraded by other negative factors, sugars, processed uh, the chemicals, etc. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, that's fascinating. Thank you very much. Pleasure.